Uh, gentlemen, um, before uh, we introduce our, I, I introduce the good doctor, um, I, was, I was asked just to uh, give a, 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 a tiny keeping it real. Um, because the ministry that uh, Matthew is going to be talking about is one that, that I have been touched by in my life. Um, just to give you a miniature background, and some of you may know this, and I apologize. Uh, my dad was, a, going back 100 years, my dad was a, a clergyman. Uh, my mom uh, was brought up to be a nun and uh, became a, um, literally, uh, and be became a nurse. Uh, so clearly for me, church attendance was mandatory. Uh, going to Sunday school every week was mandatory. Learning all the Bible verses was mandatory. And so whatever the church did uh, for kids growing up, that's what my brothers and, and, and I did. Um, you know, went away to school, became a, you know, a deacon at the, at, the, at the school church and the head deacon. And um, so I knew all the rules. I knew all the regulations. And um, that's about where it stood. Uh, the Bible was still a, a book. You know, it's like any book that you read. We read lots of books. And uh, that became my quote unquote, I don't want to call it a faith. It became what you did on Sundays. Um, that said, one of my, one of my skills was uh, sports. And uh, I, I went on to, uh, after playing college sports and everything else, uh, went on to a, a rugby career. And the problem with um, sports, the better you are, the tougher the competition gets. And I wound up playing uh, nationally all over the United States against the, uh, the highest competition that um, existed in this country. Uh, there's, two, there's two downsides to that. One, yes, it's, a, it's exciting. Uh, but two is uh, the word injuries do start to creep into your um, vocabulary, and they start out as little ones, and for some guys, uh, those injuries get bigger and bigger and, and bigger. Um, but because of the risk of, of, of so high, there's an adrenaline high that exists in the rugby community, um, which means the first three beers after the game are just to calm down, just, just to calm down, and then the party starts. And for any of you who know anything about rugby, the parties tended to go on as long as people were still standing. Um, and but there was also the, the, you know, the language is a little salty. It's a little vicious. Um, you know, four-letter uh, words are commonplace. Um, but anyway, that was my. Uh, we, at, at that particular time, I was playing out in. LA and starting a, a, a new a new uh, business a, a, a multi you know if you were buying a home in Beverly Hills I'd be the guy you'd want to talk to um, from the mortgage from the money side of things uh, but the net of it was I saw on TV uh, one of these healing services where the guy touches you in the name of Jesus you know and you'd see people healing over and I thought this is either PT Barnum or it's real um, but let's <laughs> he was coming to Anaheim so I figured let's let's go and um, we like to sit up front. Uh, we sat up front because I knew he would ask people to come up on stage. And at that time, um, I remember my prayer was, Jesus, if you're real, today would be a, a great day to let me know. Um, so when he called for people to go up on stage, I, I went up. I thought, let's, <laughs> let's see what happens. And I remember my wife told me later, she said, if anybody's not going to fall over, that'll be Peter. Um, but I had gone there for rugby injuries. I had a soggy knee. I had a sports hernia on my shoulder. Um, was a little achy, and um, that was the reason I really went. My body was in pain. Um, so, but I went up on stage, and the first thing the guy asked me when he, there were like 50 people up on stage at that time, um, he says to me, he says, do you drink? And I'm thinking, this is not why I'm here. <laughs> and I said, yeah. And he goes, in the name of Jesus. And he just lays his hand out, and the next thing I know, I'm sitting, I'm, I'm lying on the floor, and I just see people, you know, dropping all, all next to me. But that didn't seem, nothing seemed to have happened. It's just the guy touched me. And then he comes around the second time, and he goes, do you smoke? And I laughed, and I said, well, <laughs> not cigarettes. <laughs> and he touched me again. And I went out again. And um, that was beer, because it was kind of like my head cleared. It, 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 like the fog lifted, my head cleared. The bizarre thing was there was a woman, a young woman on the, lying on the stage next to me who looked like she was having an epileptic fit. 
and I, I called the usher over and I said, I think this woman's in trouble. He goes, leave her alone, she'll be fine. <laughs> I'm thinking, well, if she dies, you know, this one's on you, bud. Um, but the net of it was, she wakes up and she starts sobbing. And I go, what's the matter? She goes, you don't understand, I can, I can smell. And I'm thinking, yeah. She goes, I lost my sense of smell. And if you lose your sense of smell, you lose your sense of taste. She goes, I can smell. And I'm thinking, okay. Um, then he comes around again the third time, and this is why I'm there. He goes, he touches me for injuries. And he lays hands on me. And when I got up off the floor for that one, I'm feeling my knee doesn't hurt. The sports hernia, which just, they ache, doesn't hurt. My shoulder is fine. And I'm thinking, wow, what just happened? Um, the next Monday, or the, that was a Sunday on Monday, um, I go to work and, and you know, I'm seeing I've got five appointments that week, one Monday, one Tuesday, one Wednesday, one Thursday, one Friday, and some guy's talking about doing some multi-million dollar deal and he, and um, I've not closed any deals at this point. And uh, just as we're about to sign the papers, my hand is like being jerked back for some reason and he goes, what's the problem? I go, something crazy happened over the weekend and he starts laughing. He goes, what? And I proceeded to tell him how Jesus healed me from smoking, drinking and injuries. And he starts, now he's really laughing and I'm thinking, oh God. And he goes, yeah, same thing happened to me. <laughs> and he proceeded, he proceeded to tell me how he had broken his back and the doctor told him he'd never walk again and if any surgeon never touched him, he'd never walk. And the only thing that was going to get him off one of those tables where they turn you upside down to pee um, was uh, Jesus. And then the, the man proceeded to, the doctor proceeded to pray with him. And that's what, now he's up walking around and he's back as a fashion photographer in New York. The next day, I've got an appointment with a woman named Ann Gordy. You might know the name because she was the CEO of Motown Records. Her brother was Barry Gordy. Um, and the same thing happens in the middle of, she's about to sign the papers and literally my hand, I feel like my hand's being jerked back. And, um, she goes, what's the matter? And I said, I, I got to tell you something. And I proceeded to tell her, she goes, what? Um, she says, you can talk to me. And, and, and I proceeded to tell her about how Jesus healed me. Um, and she goes, yeah, Jesus is very special in my life too and uh, proceeds to tell me a little bit, but then her phone rings and she says, Peter, I love, love, love to talk to you, but um, Miss Ross is waiting for me outside. <laughs> so she signs the papers real fast, deal done. As I w walk out, there's Diana Ross who says hi to me on my way out the door. Um, the same thing happened with another person Wednesday. The same thing happened with another person on Thursday. Friday, I'm meeting with a guy that I know I can't do business with and um, he turns out to be my closest friend in the world, to this world today, even through today. I, I called him yesterday because I was thinking about this, this talk and he was a, a part of it. And it was my friend Joseph. And Joseph proceeds to tell me, he goes, yeah, yeah, Peter, actually I'm in the hospital, um, but I'm getting out today. Apparently he had COVID, um, but he said it was really bizarre. He says, I lost sight in my eye, in one of my eyes. And um, I go, whoa. And he said, no, 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 no. He says, I got down on my knees and I started praying. Um, and within a half hour, my sight came back. And I thought, oh, this is bizarre. But it's Jesus. And when we talk about this healing ministry, um, I can only say there's, there's two other little minor things I want to mention quickly. Um, that was 40, that was 1979. Um, I totally lost my taste for drinking. If you were to ask me if I want to drink, I would, it was like someone saying, would you like some castor oil to drink? It's like I have no thought to having a drink today. Smoking, same thing. There's just no, nothing in my brain that says, oh, have, have a smoke or have a, you know, have some weed. Um, the injuries to this day never returned. My knee is totally, absolutely pain-free. The hernia went away. The sh there's nothing. Um, but the other thing that was kind of bizarre was, and the guy never, oh, 
at the end of that week after meeting Joseph, you know, we read in the Bible about the still small voice of God. And if I were to, and this has only happened literally twice in my entire life. At the end of that week after meeting with Joseph and these five appointments um, and these healings, I heard not a palpable voice like you talking to me, but a voice in my head going, am I real yet? And I thought, what was that? And that's when I came to the conclusion, yes, Jesus is very real. And uh, however we perceive reality, let's understand Jesus is very, very real. Um, now, time to introduce Dr. Matthew. <laughs> Please welcome our dear friend, Dr. Matthew O. Thank you, everyone. Um, <clears throat> okay, my clock is running. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, what Peter said, I appreciate it. Your testimony, Peter. Uh, this is what Paul said uh, said in 1 Corinthians 2. And this is the reason why I think God still gives us healings and has miracles happen today. Uh, this is what Peter, uh, Paul said. He said, I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. My speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. And here's the, here's the kicker. So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's the reason why he continues to give us healing and miracle nowadays. So that's the whole thing. I'm done, right? <laughs> um, Paul asked me for a catchy title so you guys would come. So I, I picked a title called, My God, What Do You Want of Me? That's a question I've asked, I think I've asked all my life. You know, and you can ask it multiple different ways. Like, my God, what do you want of me? Or you could ask, my God, what do you want of me? Um, you know, Admittedly, this is my testimony and story of me pursuing the Holy Spirit. But, you know, every, every story we tell, we have to have some purpose, right? So I'm going to give you three things I learned from my life and why I tell my story. The first point is that God pursues us. i got to get one Old Testament Bible verse in there. Ezekiel 34, 11 to 12 says, this is what the Lord God says. He says, Behold, I, my, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. God himself says he's the shepherd. He's going to seek us out. You know, when I was uh, six years old, I accepted Jesus as a believer. So I guess you can say my story, my spiritual journey starts there. But, you know, in order for me to actually accept Jesus at that age, actually there were two people who had to say yes to Jesus. Because you know, very few of us have the experience that Saul of Tarsus did where he was going to Damascus and Jesus shows up to him. Uh, if you ever actually, uh, you know, follow up on stories from the Middle East, actually, Jesus is doing that to a lot of Muslims, and they are becoming believers of Jesus because they supernaturally encounter Jesus. But for most of us nowadays, that's not how we get first get introduced to Jesus. We get introduced, we get introduced to Jesus because someone else said yes to Jesus first, and then they introduce us to him. So in order for me to actually come to a, a place where I got introduced to Jesus. I said there were two men that had to say yes to Jesus. First was a, uh, an American GI named Jack Baskin. Uh, Jack came to Korea as a, an American GI, as an Air Force pilot, I believe. Uh, he almost died during the war. He was, I think, uh, maybe 21. He was very young at the time. Um, 
and he, he made a deal with God. You know, he had a, a sweetheart back at home. He said, God, if you let me get back home, I, I'm going to go back and I'll marry my sweetheart. I'll keep my promise to her and I'll give my life to you. I'll go anywhere you want me to go except this God-forsaken country of Korea. So if you ever make a deal like that with God, guess what happens? <clears throat> yeah, within 10 years, you know, he goes home, he gets married, he has five kids, he becomes a pastor, and God calls him to be a missionary to Korea. Korea. There you go. So, so Jack Baskin had to say yes to Jesus. And then on December 27th, uh, 1959, uh, there was a fire in a neighborhood in Seoul. You know, Seoul back then is not Seoul now. It was really poorly developed, coming out of, you know, what happened in Korean War. Everything was built with wood, and there was a fire in a, a neighborhood factory, and the whole neighborhood burned down. There was a, uh, a, a family, a Kim family. That was actually my mom's family. Um, my grandpa was pretty well-to-do. He was in the, uh, uh, the theater business. But that evening, they lost every single thing that they ever owned. You know, like they didn't have a bank account back then. Everything was, you know, under the pillows, right? So they lost everything. Uh, there were seven kids, mom and dad, nine in the family, Everybody was safe, but only thing they had was basically literally the, coat, the, the, the clothes that they wore. And this was, you know, December 27th. It was cold. The following day, the 28th, Jack comes to visit. He brings shoes for the girls, some blankets for the family. And that's how the Kim family got to know Jesus. Because Jack said yes to Jesus... And because of that, Daniel, the oldest in the family, who is studying to be a, a diplomat, you know, he's, you know, he has to represent the family. He's the only one who can speak English. So he goes to say thank you to Jack on a Wednesday evening. Jack is preaching, and for the first time in his life, he hears about Jesus. Took a little bit of time, but Daniel accepts Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And he actually is 80, he's in the upper 80s now. He still pastors the same church that Jack and he founded in 1960. Same church. Um, he's still pastoring, he's still preaching, and because of those two men saying yes to Jesus, at age of six, I heard about Jesus. I knew, even then, that there was a struggle within me. As Paul said in Romans 7, I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? At six years old, I understood this. You all understand this, but, you know, we all have a moment in life where Jesus gets your attention. It happened to me early, but he got my attention, and I said yes. The uh, second point that I want to actually tell you is that our God speaks to us. Um, in John chapter 10, Jesus actually picks up the metaphor that Ezekiel you know, I, I read to you Ezekiel 34. Jesus picks up that same metaphor in John chapter 10. This is what he says. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He goes on later in on chapter 10, and he says this. He, again, he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, 
My own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. I mean, surely the Bible tells us that God speaks, right? Old Testament, Moses, right? The burning bush, right? At the mountain of God. Elijah, actually at the same mountain. They, Peter mentioned the, the quiet, still voice of the Lord. The prophets all heard his voice. But, you know, most of us, perhaps because I went to a particular church, you know, we've been told that the stories in the Bibles are exceptional stories. But here's the secret, guys. The Bible is not a book of exceptions, but a book of examples. I'm going to say it again. The Bible is not a book of exceptions, but a book of examples. Even the incredible stories of healings, miracles, people encountering God, it's not a like a, a once-in-a-lifetime experience. It's not a like once-in-a-universe kind of an experience. Actually, that's a, an example to the people of God of how God wants to deal with us. You know, I grew up in a church where we were taught that, you know, God spoke in the past and he did all the miracles and all of that, but then, you know, he... He finished speaking after the, the Bible was completed. You know, the canon's completed, and then he didn't need to speak anymore. I don't know if you guys ever heard that theology. Uh, it's called cessationism. It's actually called dispensational cessationism if you study theology. A lot of Christians believe that. I mean, we love the Word. We study the Word. We're in the Word. Absolutely, there's nothing wrong with it. But somehow we think, or we've been taught, that God does not speak. But, you know, even if you're in that kind of church, you know, like if you're trying to seek God's will and you just don't find it, you're like in the Bible, but you don't hear him, um, you know, where do you go? Who do you go to? I mean, surely the pastor must know, right? Like, pastor must hear from God somehow. You know, when I was about to graduate from college, um, I asked Daniel, my Uncle Daniel, because I had a choice before me. I wasn't sure if I was supposed to go into ministry or not. Because Jesus meant something real to me. And somehow I had an inkling that maybe I'm supposed to do something for God, whatever that was. And, you know, only example before me was that Daniel and a lot of other pastors that were my mentors. So I thought maybe I'm supposed to be a pastor. So I did ask Daniel that question, and this is what he said. He actually said the exact same thing that Peter said. He said, I heard the voice of God. The still, quiet voice of God. And he didn't tell me exactly what God had told him, actually. I had to go find that out. I just found that last night, Paul. He said, you are mine. Those are the words that God spoke to Daniel. And because of that, I'm, my sound is kind of going, okay, here we go. All right. Uh, and it's because of that that Daniel, instead of becoming a diplomat, he gave up all the things that would come with becoming a diplomat, and he became a pastor. Actually, my grandfather, his father, was adamantly opposed to him becoming a pastor. Um, neither was my grandma, actually, you know, because he was the first Christian in the family. It took them some time to realize who Jesus was. And actually, the whole, all the sisters, the six girls underneath Daniel, all, all, the, all the kids became believers before my grandparents became believers. So that's what Daniel told me. So I thought to myself, well, I didn't really hear that voice of God. I was just being honest. 
So I decided to become a doctor. That was a good option, right? Applied to medical school. There's a whole story behind getting into medical school, which really was God's provision. It took me twice. Um, I'm not going to go there because I have a lot of other good stories to tell. So m moving forward, I'm in medical school now. You know, it's four years of hard studying. I, you know, I went to Harvard, as you guys saw. I didn't really study at Harvard. Those of you guys know, you go to Harvard, you don't study so hard. But in medical school, I actually studied. I really applied myself. Um, so I, I matched back to Harvard to train there. So I'm about to graduate. And I don't know if you guys know that doctors, we, we take this oath called Hippocratic Oath, right? Well, you know, Hippocratic Oath was actually made in ancient Greece. So in the original text, you take an oath to Apollos, because that's the god of healing in, in the Greek world. So, you know, I'm a believer in Jesus. I can't do that. So the Christian Medical Dental Association, you know, had a ceremony that year for all the graduating students. And, you know, you take an oath to our God, right, the, the tri triune God, right, and take oath to him about how we're going to practice as doctors. And the speaker that day, um, Dr. David Stevens, he, he's actually – he was, at the time, CEO of the Christian Medical Dental Association. He was a, a missionary surgeon, and, you know, he was a Baptist. He, he gave a good Baptist sermon, gave an altar call, and I went down to the front, and I knelt, as a good Baptist boy should, and I gave my career, surgical career, to Jesus. And while I was still on my knees in the front at the altar, I heard his voice for the first time. It wasn't a quiet, still voice for me. It was actually very loud. Louder than how you would hear my voice, but clearly it wasn't a human being speaking because no one else heard the voice. And this is what he said. He said, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And here was, I'd never heard his voice before. But I knew, I knew, I knew whose voice that was. Of course I knew where in the Bible that was in. But when you hear his voice for the first time, I guarantee you, man, if you haven't cried, you're going to cry. Because we're meant to hear his voice. Because he still speaks to us. That is revelation. Revelation is when you meet God and he speaks to you. And because of that one moment of revelation, it took me through nine years of surgical training. And if you ever know anything about medicine and becoming a surgeon, it's gruesome. It's a lot of hours. You lose a lot of sleep. It's very challenging. It changes you. But that one moment of revelation when he said, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me, allowed me to stay true to him for those nine years. So moving forward, you know, this is like just over four years ago, actually. It wasn't too long ago. <clears throat> you know, by this time, I'm now in private practice. You know, I'm taking care of lots of sick people. Uh, I used to practice in New Jersey, northern New Jersey. I was making more money than I ever thought I would. It's probably not a lot of money compared to what you guys made. But as a doctor, I, I, that was a lot of money. I was married. You know, you guys, I, I don't have time to tell you all our stories, but my wife loves Jesus. That's how I fell in love with her. I saw her worshiping Jesus. And I, I just knew that was, she was the one for me. We have two kids. Life is going great. I'm actually going on missions trips to Mongolia. Like, I'm doing God's work. I, I'm a, the co-president of the New York City chapter of Christian Medical Dental Association. But, you know, somehow we felt, I felt like something was missing. You know, it's like, 
there's got to be more to a Christian walk, Christian life, than what I was living. And everybody would have said Matthew was living a, like an exemplary Christian life. But something was missing. So, you know, I, I did what I only thing that I knew to do, which was get into the Bible again. I mean, right? What else do I need to, did I need to, did I know how to do? Um, I was driving three hours a day uh, for commute at that time. So I got the whole Bible on the audio. I just put it on while I was driving. And what else am I going to, not going to listen to music. I'm going to listen to the Word of God. So I, I listened through the Bible. I'm like, wow, okay, I learned a lot, actually. There were some parts of the Bible I thought I knew, but I didn't. But even then, something was missing. And we got introduced to a ministry called Christian Union. And that's how I got to meet Ken Fish. And I'm sitting in front of Ken teaching. I like to sit up first row. He's like where Peter's at. Like we're not too far. Ken is talking about the Spirit, Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12. And I just came to a conclusion. Well, this guy is smart, and he knows the Bible better than any pastor I've ever met. And I've met a lot of pastors. I've met some really good pastors. But he knew the Bible better than any of them. And the big difference between Ken and me was that he believed that the Holy Spirit was still doing the things that happened in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. And he could give you all these stories. And I thought to myself, okay, there's something different here. And Ken is still preaching. I'm here. He's not finished talking because, you know, he can go on for a while. And I hear the same voice that I heard earlier. He said, I'm going to give you the gift of faith. I was like, I thought I had faith. He said, I'm going to give you the gift of faith. And then we're done, and Ken's asking everyone to stand up, and I had no idea what was happening. We're going into ministry time, and I've never been in one. And then, he's, and then I hear the voice again. And he says, I'm going to heal your left shoulder. Now, at the time, I had a torn rotator cuff injury. And being the good doctor that I am, I didn't go see my own doctor, right? Because as soon as I went, I knew I'm going to get an MRI, and then I have to go see an orthopedic surgeon. I'm going to get an arthroscopic surgery. I'll be out of the operating for at least six weeks, if not more. And the last thing you want to tell a surgeon is you can't operate. So I didn't go see my doctor. I was just grinning and bearing through the pain. And, you know, I'm doing routine laparoscopic surgery, and my shoulder's killing me, at, you know, even before the, before the surgery's finished. And he said, I'm going to heal your left shoulder. And literally, less than five seconds later, Ken says, is there someone with a left shoulder pain? <clears throat> and, you know, my wife was sitting next, uh, my wife was next to me. She was really wondering, what is Matthew thinking about what Ken is teaching, right? Because at that time, I had no understanding of the Holy Spirit. And I just put my hand up. I'm ready to go. Like, me. Now, I wasn't the only one who raised the hands and stepped up. Because there were other people with left shoulder pain that day. And just so you know, Ken didn't pray for me. Because he wanted to teach. So he asked for a volunteer who had never prayed for any kind of healing. And this brunette, 20-some-year-old, she's green as green it, it comes. She comes up and she puts her hand on my shoulder and just kind of repeats what Ken says, what we should pray. And after two prayers, my pain is gone. I, I could only do this and have pain, and I could do all of this and keep my hands up and do the surgery and not have pain. Yeah, right? My jaw is like, uh, I don't know how to explain this because I'm a surgeon. You know, we cut people for a living to help them. Yeah, exactly. And then I came to a realization. I needed to repent. Because I'm a, a, a surgeon, a healer in the natural, 
and I had told the great physician that he wasn't in the business of healing anymore. And I surrendered my life to Jesus again that night. I told him, I'm putting all my theology aside, you know, all the learning, whatever, just putting it aside. Jesus, I'm open to anything and everything you want to do. And that night, Ken did pray for me, for me to experience the Holy Spirit, just like in the book of Acts. And, you know, like, I can't really even describe even to this day what I experienced. But one was, I had my eyes closed, but I was seeing things. You know, it was like, uh, I don't know, grayscale, more like red scale. I was seeing things. I couldn't even comprehend what I was seeing. I think I was seeing in the spiritual world, for the first time in my life, I didn't have even the language to understand what I was seeing. But I had said yes to Jesus, to whatever he wanted. And then the other thing was, my body was shaking. As if electricity was going through me. And the only thing I didn't want to do is I didn't want to fall. So I locked my knees. And God, I don't know what was happening, but whatever it is, I, I, I'm okay with it. And I sat down. That was on a Friday, Saturday. So on Sunday, we go to our usual church. Our best friends at the time were another physician couple. And the wife of that couple comes up to me that morning, says, Matt, what happened to you? Like, you're glowing. I have been changed because I encountered the Holy Spirit. I heard his voice, and his power was not something I was just reading about anymore. It became real in my own life. Now, um, so, you know, I'm still trained as a doctor. I can't turn my brain off. So I had to now investigate. So I took a little journal and, you know, tried to be a scientist. So... Every time I pray for someone, I make a note. I was like, what did I pray for? What was the condition? And then what happened? You know, and, you know, at first, you know, you're, you're a little sheepish about these things. So, you know, you just pray for whoever they'll let you pray for. So was, my kids got a lot of prayer. You know, my wife got a lot of prayer. But whoever would let me pray, I pray. And then after 33 times, I realized that this was no fluke, this was no accident, this was no placebo. God was still in the business of healing. Now, he didn't heal everybody I pray for, but this was not a coin flip, okay? Like, rash on my daughter's face, my son's face, actually, just doesn't go away, like, instantaneously because I prayed. No, that doesn't happen. And then you get a little bolder and you start praying for bigger things. So, you know, I told you I used to go to these trips to Mongolia for medical missions. You know, we go and we teach the doctors there. You know, they're, they're, the Mongolian medical system, you know, they're only 20 years out of communism, so they're a little bit behind. They're actually doing a pretty good job catching up. So, you know, we go there and we give them the latest lectures. You know, a surgeon, I help them do some operations, try to, you know, give them some knowledge. You know, and then we go to a, a local church, and, you know, their local church, they literally have nothing. You got people who are sick, and they can't afford to go to see a doctor. They can't get medicines. The only thing they've got is their faith and belief that God's going to answer their prayer. So, you know, like one doctor would have a, you know, a you know, screening for diabetes. Another doctor would have a screening for blood pressure. And I got the table set, prayer. <laughs> so the uh, first family that comes up is this mom and daughter. And the daughter... It's like got this long hair. 
She's totally disheveled. Like, hair's coming down on her face. I mean, she looked bad. And mom is literally dragging her to our table because she's afraid that her daughter's going to commit suicide because she's been threatening to commit suicide. Right, I'm not going to tell you all the details of prayer because it was not an instantaneous prayer. You know, sometimes you read, like Jesus said, be healed, and boom, it happens. It happens like that sometimes. But other times, it says Jesus kept on praying. So sometimes you have to try. There's some repentance that need to be done. There's got to be some forgiveness that needs to happen. And so there, there's, you know, sometimes it's not just like an instantaneous healing. Well, for this lady, young lady, it was not. But I got to tell you something. When we, and some of you, this is going to like blow your grid. When we commanded the spirit of depression and suicide out of this girl, it was like as if she woke up. She cracked a smile for the first time while we were there. She had tears rolling down her eyes. Jesus came through for her. Now, before I left Mongolia, I met with her two more times. So there's a lot of stuff that we needed to pray through. You don't get to that point just with, you know, one sin or one sin done against you. You know, a lot of things happen in life, right? But when we were finished with the third appointment, when she showed up for the third appointment, instead of the disheveled, dark, gloomy face, her hair was all done, she had her makeup on, she was a different young lady. Here's another story. That same day, the family rolls up a, a lady in a wheelchair. I was like, wow, okay. <laughs> this one's challenging. <clears throat> this lady had fallen um, 14 years ago, broke her hip, and back then in Mongolia, they didn't have surgery to fix that, so she never got her hip fixed. So ever since she fell, she couldn't walk. The church didn't have ramps, so they had to literally carry her out of the wheelchair, go up the steps into the sanctuary, and then put her back in the wheelchair. Now, it took us about an hour to pray for her. And actually, she needed to repent of some sins that she hadn't repented of. And more importantly, she had lots of people who sinned against her that she needed to forgive. Now, why, are, why am I telling you these things? Why, is this, why are these things important? Because, you know, when we sin, it's like we give foothold to the enemy. We give opportunity for the enemy to basically attack us. Pretty simple. When we don't forgive, actually we harbor we harbor bitterness in our hearts and it's like drinking poison and wishing someone else would get sick, right? You're getting sick. So after she confessed her sin, uh, and, and this was interesting, uh, she was so embarrassed to confess her sins. You know, James says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. But, you know, nowadays, we don't really do confession anymore. Now, some of you, when, we, when I was here in December and we got to pray, you actually made your confession. And those of you, when you did that, it brought freedom. Because it was not a secret anymore. Your sins were forgiven. A brother was there with you to witness what had happened. So she had to forgive. And she had to repent. And then we prayed for healing of her legs. I said, come on, let's stand up. Let's see if you can walk. First time, I was like, I was basically trying to lift her out of the wheelchair, okay? It wasn't working. So she had to sit back down, and we prayed again. Second time, she actually got up much faster, 
and she was on her feet for several minutes. Started to shuffle her legs. I had to hold her so we didn't want her to fall. And then she had to go back, sit, sit back down. We prayed again. Third time, she got up a little faster even now. Started to move her legs a little faster. We're still holding her hands, but the sanctuary was like half the size of this restaurant. She went around the whole sanctuary. Everybody's going crazy. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Because they all knew that this lady had not walked for 14 years. I did pray for her, you know, several days later before I left. She started to move even faster. Actually, one time when we were praying, she said, oh, uh, uh, I feel electricity in my leg. I was like, why? And then it dawned on me that she had a nerve injury when she broke her hip. So her nerve was dead, and God was going to heal her leg. Well, he's got to heal the nerve too, and when he heals the nerve, now the nerve starts to work, and now she's feeling electricity that she hadn't felt before. She's feeling sensation that she hadn't had for 14 years, and she's walking. Um, so I told you she had a wheelchair. Six months later, she traded her wheelchair in for a walker. She was not walking perfectly, granted, but she was walking. You see, I have no grid in my medical training to be able to tell you how that works. Because there's no explanation. Because our God is supernatural. He, by definition, he transcends the natural. Lastly, and we're going to close with this, I want to tell you that our God calls us to follow him. You guys know the story of the rich young ruler. Mark's version says, Jesus, looking at him, loved him, said to him, you lack one thing, go sell all that you have, give to the poor, you will have treasure in heaven. Come, follow me. Sadly, this young ru ruler, he couldn't follow Jesus. He had to turn away, disheartened and sorrowful. Mark says that he was actually on his knees before Jesus. He was sincere about the question that he was asking. What must I do to inherit eternal life? You know, there's another story in Luke of another man who fell on Jesus' feet. He was fishing all night. He caught nothing. And then Jesus told him, put it over here. It's like, come on, Jesus. I did this all night. But, you know, since you say, I'm going to do it. And when there were more fish than he could count in that net, Simon Peter fell at the feet of Jesus and said this, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. So before Jesus, gentlemen, what is going to be our response? You know, Jesus said he loved the rich young ruler. Mark says it, make very clear. Jesus loved him. Jesus called the rich young ruler, come and follow me. That's the same invitation that Peter got. But two men made two different decisions. I decided to make my decision. I went from being a surgeon, now I'm a full-time minister. You know, maybe in the future, Jesus is going to call me back into the operating room. That's okay. But for now, I'm doing what Jesus has called me to do. You know, we're healing the sick, we're casting out demons, we're cleansing the lepers. I got to be honest, we haven't raised the dead yet. <laughs> we're working on that, right? But Jesus is pursuing us, okay? He has pursued all of you gentlemen and used other people, <clears throat> their yeses and their obediences so that you could know about Jesus, so you could have a walk with him. The question is, 
Are you going to follow him? Are you going to say, I'm going to just drop everything and go follow him? Now, I don't know what that means for you. I know what it means for me. Okay? But somewhere along the way, I am certain that Jesus' invitation is actually open to every single one of us. But perhaps some of us, we're going to be like the rich young ruler. But I really pray that we will all be like Simon Peter. That we would say to him, I'm a sinful man, Lord, but I'm still going to follow you. This is what Jesus said in Mark 8. This is my last line. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return? For his soul. 